Hey there guys and welcome back to the channel. My name is Titch and you're watching Titch Fish. And today it's another Triple T, Titch's Top 10s. And this time it's Titch's Top 10s that are good, but not great. Now, have you ever watched a film where you think to yourself, oh my God, this film is just so good. It's just so, so good. But then a few minutes later, you think to yourself, actually, what about that bit in there? No, that bit. Oh, that bit was off, wasn't it? Oh, no. I don't like that bit, no. Oh, that bit was strange. Now, stuff can happen in a film that can stop it from just about reaching greatness. Whether it be pacing issue, character underdevelopment, or strange directions a story might go in. Things like this can stop a film right in its tracks, stopping it from reaching its full potential. So today, I'm going to be talking about some of the films that didn't quite reach the heights that it should have. And with that being said, let's talk about Titch's top 10 films that are good, but not great. Lights. Camera, action. I did not hit her. It's not true. It's bull. I did not hit Number her. Number ten. I did not. Oh hi, Mark. I see you shiver with anticipation. The Rocky Horror Picture Show. Patient. From the strange mind of Richard O'Brien comes this gothic yet camp horror musical. And let me tell you, this film is bonkers. From its opening number to its closing scene. And damn it, Janet, what an opening number. It's funny, it's upbeat, great start to the movie. And then we get to the castle and we do the time warp. Excellent. And then we get introduced to the film's main antagonist, Dr. Frankenfurter, played by one of my favorite actors, Tim Curry. And of course, Sweet Transvestite is amazing. And then the film slows down quite a bit actually. And the only time it picks up again is during the musical numbers. But then it slows down again. But there are some interesting bits. The two bedroom scenes are really good. Oh, what have you done with Brad? Uh, well, nothing. Why, do you think I should? But really, we're just waiting for the next musical number to kick in. Hot Patootie, sung by Meatloaf, and Eddie are two great examples. Now, remember when I said that this film is bonkers? Well, in the second act, it gets a bit too bonkers and it starts getting really, really hard to follow. But in the third act, I was completely lost. I had no idea what the hell was going on. And by the time the film had ended, I just didn't care anymore. Now, I've watched the film, the stage show, and the TV remake, and I still haven't got a clue what's going on. Now, with a tad more focus and dying down the craziness at the end, I think this film could have been great. But still, the Rocky Horror Picture Show deserves its cult status. And I, along with its dedicated fan base, would definitely do the time warp again. Candles, the music, number nine, the sexy dress. I mean, what's going on here? I'm going on the Hobbit attack. trilogy. Now, it would be an understatement to say that there was a lot of hype around The Hobbit. People couldn't wait to revisit Middle Earth, so there was a lot of pressure for Peter Jackson and the team to get this one right. Not just to bring the people back to Middle Earth, but to bring new people in as well. And for the most part, it accomplishes that. From old places like the Shire and Rivendell to new locations such as Esgaroth and the Lonely Mountains. It's exciting and nostalgic to explore this world. But that was half the battle. This world needs characters. And my god, there are a lot of them. Maybe too many. I mean, in The Lord of the Rings, there was a fellowship of nine characters, with others coming and going in support. But in Hobbit, we have 14. 15 if you count Gandalf. And a lot of them I can't even name because they don't get enough screen time. I mean, Bilbo Baggins is great. And seeing Gandalf again is amazing, especially with Ian McKen reprising the role. You've changed. I'm not entirely for the better, Bilbo Beckins. I'm sorry, do I know you? Well, you know my name, although you don't remember I belong to it. I'm Gandalf. And for an Oakenshield, I find quite compelling. But apart from a few exceptions, I can't name any of the bloody dwarfs. Dwalin, Barling, Killy, Philly, Garwin, Boffin, Sue? I don't know! A few familiar faces show up here too. Some welcoming, others not so much. Why do I get arrogant prick vibes from Legolas? I don't like it. Along with the new faces, it can be overwhelming. Now, the special effects are really good, especially when it comes to the locations. And Smog, that's some scary shit, dude. But it's very off-putting when it comes to the goblins and the set pieces. In fact, this is The Hobbit's biggest problem. Because in The Lord of the Rings, they used practical effects. They used costume and makeup to make the enemies look more intimidating and terrifying. Here, I find it hard to get invested. I can tell that they're not really there. 
I can understand why they did it, and they put a lot of effort into this, but nothing beats practical effects if done right. Sadly, The Hobbit doesn't quite reach the same height Lord of the Rings does, but there is more than enough here to warrant a visit to Middle Earth, and go there and back again with Bilbo Baggins. I do believe the worst is behind us. One of them found out about it, beat her up so bad she ended up in a hospital Number eight. on Guerrero Street. <laughs> what a story, Mark. Reservoir Dogs. Quentin Tarantino's feature length debut, and wow, what a good first impression. How can a film be so cool and yet so dirty at the same time? No matter how confident you are that your plan will succeed, it can all turn to shit. And this film does a very good job in showing that. Well, the aftermath anyway. And things go from bad to worse for Mr. White and his team. Now the thing is with Tarantino is that he's not a filmmaker. He's a moment maker. And that's not a bad thing. And Reservoir Dogs has some great moments in there. The opening scene in the diner is brilliant. And the torture scene with Mr. Blonde is something special. With Harvey Keitel and Steve Buscemi in standout performances. You wanna shoot me, you little piece of Go ahead, take a shot. F you, White. I didn't create this situation, I'm dealing with it. I'm acting like a professional. But if I'm honest, I kind of see this film as an experiment. I see what Tarantino's going for here, and I see it in a lot of his other films. And whilst it works everywhere else, it doesn't quite work here. How it's shot, how the characters interact, how they play off each other. Apart from a few scenes here and there, nothing clicks. And I can't quite put my finger on why that is. I can see Tarantino's inspiration from gangster flicks and heist movies. And it really does rub off here, but it needs its own identity, but he just hasn't found it yet. And it's not until his next film, Pulp Fiction, is where he truly comes into his own. And Pulp Fiction is a masterpiece. In the end, I'm very thankful for Reservoir Dogs. It led the way for future films like this, and it's still worth watching for all those great moments. Hey, what's going on? Hey. You hear that? <laughs> I don't want to get into it. Underwear, man, come on. Number seven. Oh, are you okay? Are you, right? are you okay? Yeah. The Simpsons movie. Uh oh. Now, I don't think it needs to be said, but The Simpsons has gone downhill over the past two decades. For me, I think it was season 10 onwards, so it was a bit weird to find out that they were making a feature length film. Now, it was going to go one of two ways. It was either going to recapture the old days of The Simpsons, or it was going to be a total train wreck. And what we got was... Well, it wasn't a train wreck. To be honest, from season 10 onwards, this was the best thing The Simpsons did up to this point. It's actually quite charming. A few good jokes do land. Stay back, I got a chainsaw. The main plot's interesting and the subplots fold in quite nicely. And the animation is fine with me. If it's not broke, don't fix it. And the villain is probably the best thing about this film. I want 10,000 tough guys, and I want 10,000 soft guys to make the tough guys look tougher. And here's how I want them arranged. Tough, tough, soft. Sir, I'm afraid you've gone mad with power. Of course I have. Have you ever tried going mad without power? It's boring, no one listens to you. And all our favorite characters are here too. Even Fat Tony shows up, but I'll get to him or more his voice actor later. Now, remember when I said that a few good jokes do land? A lot of them don't. Mostly like the post season 10 humor. Jokes that are not really jokes. Also, I feel like the main plot is mostly based around Homer, because when it gets to the third act, the rest of the family seem to take a back seat. And I think it would have been better if they all played a part in the climax. And the other thing about Homer is that he's a massive asshole. I have no idea why they made him like this. It would have been better if they brought back the Homer from pre-season 10. The lovable idiot that messes up, but always tries to do right by the end. We kind of get it here, but for the most part, we get a neglectful, inconsiderate, selfish moron. Oh, and also, Bart's Willy. Stupid! Is The Simpsons movie the greatest animated film of all time? No. Could it have been? Not really, but it is better than it had any right to be. It's entertaining and quite a funny time killer, with our favourite faces from Springfield and America's favourite family. Number six. Les Miserables. A 
adapting a stage musical to the big screen is no easy task. And Tom Hooper took on the challenge of adapting the biggest and probably the most difficult one of them all. The setting of revolutionary France had to bring us in. The characters had to make us emotionally invest. And the musical numbers had to be as big as they were on the stage. And the film does this. For the most part. The songs and the singing are both this film's blessings and its curse. The big numbers look down one day more and do you hear the people sing had to deliver? And they did. And the other songs range from great to fine to meh. And the same goes for the singing. This film would have been a lot better if they didn't sing everything. There's very little dialogue here. And sometimes it comes off sounding weird. Get out of here. Don't understand. Clear out of here. Stole a loaf of bread. What the hell was that? But the biggest issue for this film is its casting. But don't get me wrong, there are some great performances here. Anne Hathaway's Fantine is heartbreaking along with I Dreamed a Dream. Sasha Baron Cohen and Helena Bowen Carter work very well together here. Along with their funny and foot stomping performance of Master of the House. And from what I believe is an overlooked performance from Samantha Bark. And this guy. The people of Paris sleep in their beds. You have no chance. Why throw your lives away? He's only in there for a few seconds. He's very bloody good. And Russell Crowe is outstanding too. For all the wrong reasons. The flames, the soul. Damn it man, take some night nurse and get a good night's sleep. You sound like sh Amanda Seyfried and Eddie Redmayne are quite bland. They really did nothing for me. Hugh Jackman's Jean Valjean is very, very, very disappointing. This character needed so much more and Hugh Jackman didn't bring his A-game here. In fact, when it comes to musicals, I don't think he ever did. Please don't kill me. All in all, Les Miserables is still a nice bit of musical magic. I just wish Hooper and the team took a bit more creative liberty here and smoothened the experience because it's quite rough in places. A bit of odd casting, but had some really good performances here. And when this film needed to be epic, this film more than rises to the occasion. It's far from perfect, but I'll always return to hear the people sing. Am I wrong? What? Number five. What are you nuts? Just Pocahontas. Like The Hobbit, Pocahontas had a lot to live up to. The Lion King was released a year before and was a smash hit at one point becoming the highest grossing animated film in history. So, did Pocahontas reach those expectations? Uh, no, no, not, not really. But there is a lot to like about this film. Right off the bat, the animation is absolutely gorgeous. It totally fits the Native American setting. Title character, Pocahontas, is great. Always questioning her future and looking for something more in life. Yeah, she's a lot like other princesses like Belle and Ariel. But that's not a big deal here. And the songs along with the score are absolutely amazing. Just Around the Riverbend is a cracker and Curse of the Wind is one of my favourite Disney songs. All of them great, except for one, which I consider to be the worst Disney song of all time. Mine, mine, f mine. A song about digging for gold. Which, believe it or not, is the villain's main motivation. Speaking of the villain, Ratcliffe is absolute crap. He's unrememberable and way too simple. In fact, the side characters are forgettable as well. Except for Grandmother Willow, who's both wise and caring, a sort of mother to Pocahontas. Everyone else is just a bit flat. Actually, John Smith is quite rememberable, because how could you forget a name like John Smith? He's Pocahontas' love interest, and that's about as far as it goes. Even Mel Gibson sounds like he's bored. And who could blame him? He's got nothing to work with here. And they should have done more of the conflict between the natives and the settlers. The tension was there, but there should have been more engagement. I mean, not a full-on battle, but a conversation or two. Pocahontas has a strong leading protagonist, amazing animation, powerful message, and tunes that will make me come back for more. But it's let down with weak writing, forgettable characters, a lousy villain, and a damn awful song about <sighs> digging for gold. Hey, nonny, nonny, hey, nonny, nonny. Ooh, how I love. F 
sake. If he's shrimpy, you're not good. You Number four. Just a chicken. Chip, 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 chip. The Dark Knight Rises. To me, the Dark Knight trilogy is one of the best trilogies of all time. Fight me, bitch. Leaving behind the campiness of the Schumacher films for a dark, gritty, and grounded tone. Starting with the fantastic Batman Begins, then the Dark Knight, which is considered to be one of the best films of all time, and the Dark Knight Rises is good. It's good. It's good. It's, it's good. It's good. It's good. There are a lot of good things in this film, but it's got one big problem, with some tiny ones thrown in. The film taking place four years after Harvey Dent's death is a good place to start, with Batman nowhere to be seen, with Bane being the perfect villain for this film. Speaking of Bane, Tom Hardy is really good in the role, even though you can't quite make out what he says sometimes. But still, he looks intimidating, and Bane breaking the Batman's back is a great moment. I was wondering what would break first. <laughs> Your spirit? Oh, your buddy! Anne Hathaway is great as Catwoman. She's bad, but it's understandable, and she does good by the end. Casting wise, the film is fine, except for Joseph Gordon Levitt's John Blake. I'm finding it hard to find full justification for this character being here. And is it just me, or does it sound like Christian Bale's just giving up? Where's the trigger? The moment Bane took control of the city is intense, but what happened before it really annoys me. Why would you send every single police officer underground to look for one man and a few loonies? It just doesn't make sense to me. But I could forgive all that, all of that, if it wasn't for the film's one big problem. The ending. Batman sacrificing himself to save the city. Fine. Him surviving the blast. Also fine. Him pissing off to another country, leaving Gotham to clear up the mess that he left behind. No. I don't think Christopher Nolan has properly grasped the idea of Robin. He wasn't just some random copper with a nickname. Yeah, no one saw it coming, but at the same time, no one wanted it either. But when it comes down to it, without the nitpicking, The Dark Knight Rises falls flat on its face when it reaches the finish line, stopping it from becoming the perfect trilogy. But it's got a lot of great moments, enough twists and turns to make sure you finish the trilogy. My mother warned me about getting into cars with strange men. This isn't a car. I tell you it's confidential. Number oh, three. Come on, why not? No, I can't. Anyway, how is your sex life? 2001 A Space Odyssey. Now, I have a feeling that I'm going to upset quite a few people with this. <laughs> but please let me explain. 2001 A Space Odyssey sets the standard for sci-fi films going forward. You can see its influence in films like Alien, Star Wars, and heck, even the Star Trek movies. I'm glad it exists. The best thing about 2001 A Space Odyssey is its cinematography. The shots of space, the shuttles, the space stations are absolutely incredible and still hold up to this day. And the classical music that accompanies it is absolute perfection. It's like looking into the future of space travel it's a hell of a lot of fun. And if it was 80 minutes of that, I would have been so happy. But unfortunately, it's not. There's a few things in this film that I just don't understand. The opening scene at the beginning of time is too odd for me. I found HAL 9000 very uninteresting. To Kubrick, it might be quite clever to link the alien monolith to life in the universe, but to me, I think it's a load of bollocks. Or is it? Could everything I thought about the universe be wrong? Did aliens play a part in life on Earth? Does God actually exist? Is OJ innocent? Was Brock really holding a donut? Oh, for f**k's sake, this is what I'm trying to get at. Kubrick overthought this, which made us overthink it. He should have just kept it simple, taking us on a journey through space and showing us the future of space travel. Because what I saw was amazing and it's inspiring. But it was too smart for its own good, with a pointless villain and a baffling plot that didn't need to be there. But again, I'm happy and grateful that this film exists. And it's the first thing I think about when I hear this music. Uh, no, actually, um, that's a lie. Woo! Nice. Come on, folks. Good 
Number two. Just the Godfather Part 3. They pull me back in. The Godfather Part 3 was released 16 years after Godfather Part 2. So within that gap, Coppola could come up with another great movie sequel, right? Right? Part 3 is set 20 years after the events of Part 2. And you can see it when you look at Michael Corleone. He comes off cold and unapproachable. But as the film goes on, he learns to let go for the sake of his family and Al Pacino pulls off the role perfectly. Now when it comes to the plot, as gangster flicks go, it's business as usual. Meaning it's your standard, I try to do business with this guy, this guy screws me over, this guy tries to kill me, the other guy tries to get revenge. And there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, The Godfather needs to be like that. I think this film should be more about Michael and his family more than anything. And the family aspect of the film is really good. Now on the gangster side of things, it goes a bit WTF. When you think of gangster hits, you don't think of attack helicopters. <laughs> Since when did the Godfather become Rambo, for God's sake? Also, I mentioned Fat Tony's voice actor, Joey Mangtanga. Mangtani? Mangtang? Mangtang? Sorry, I'm butchering the name. Forgive me, don't whack me, for God's sake. Because he makes an appearance here too. Not to say it's a bad performance, but it is part of the reason why The Godfather Part 3 is starting to look like a parody of The Godfather. The side characters come off as more as gangster caricatures, if you know what I mean. And Sofia Coppola? Dad? Yep, it's pretty bad. The Godfather Part 3 is an odd one. It shows both the best in The Godfather and the worst. Some bad acting, cartoonish gangster characters, and some odd moments that want to make you say, I'm out. But Pacino's performance, and focusing more on the family side of mob life, starts pulling your back in. But I must say, if you truly want a great gangster experience, you watch Goodfellas. <laughs> and my number one film You're that is lying. good, I but not great. You. you are tearing me apart, Lisa! Star Wars Episode 3, Revenge of the Sith. Now, who would have thought a Star Wars film would be my number one? But I do believe that Episode 3 is the Star Wars film that needs defending the most. No. I guess. After the disappointment of the Phantom Menace and the dumpster fire that has attacked the clones, we didn't know how well everything was going to fall into place for the rise of the Empire. It could have been an absolute disaster, but by some miracle, George Lucas somehow pulls it off with one of the most emotional moments in Star Wars history. Execute Order 66. We witnessed Order 66 firsthand. It's shocking and devastating. Definitely worth watching Revenge of the Sith for that moment alone. But there's more great stuff to be seen here. Chancellor Palpatine showing his true evil is a real big highlight for me. Slowly but surely becoming the Emperor in all his evil glory. And the action sequences are really good too. Which includes what I believe to be the best lightsaber duel of all time. Putting it all together, it makes a really good Star Wars experience. But George had to push it, didn't he? He had to add the ham and cheese. The Anakin and Padme scenes are just as unwatchable as they were in Attack of the Clones. The acting is cringe-inducing and the dialogue is terrible. I literally have to grit my teeth to stop my guts from throwing up. You're so beautiful. It's only because I'm so in love. No. <laughs> No, it's because I'm so in love with you. Oh, so love God, is no. Even outside the scenes, Hayden Christensen's performance still leaves a lot to be desired. He sounds disinterested and so low on energy. But when he turns to the dark side, all we can see is anger and it's very intense. It's just a shame he couldn't bring it out verbally. It lets the film down quite a bit. Also, I'm pretty sure Obi-Wan is laughing at this point. I have seen a security hologram of him Killing younglings. Dude, I think you should have got it out of your system before telling her, mate. Overall, this is definitely the best of the Star Wars prequels, but it does struggle to let go of the other two films' failings. Cheesy dialogue, piss poor acting, it really does hold the film back from being great. But I still highly recommend this one, and I still find enjoyment with every rewatch. 
Moments like Order 66 are game changers and the lightsaber battles can still be epic. This film and the other Star Wars films will always have a special place in my heart. A Star Wars Episode 3 Revenge of the Sniff. Revenge of the, Revenge of the Sniff. <laughs> and those are the reasons why Star Wars Episode 3 Revenge of the Sith is my number one. It's over, Anakin. I have the high ground. You underestimate my power. Don't try it. <laughs> And those are Titch's top 10 films that are good, but not great. But what do you guys think? Do you agree with my list? Do you disagree with my list? What films do you think are good, but not great? Comment down below and let me in the know. And that's about everything for today, guys. And thank you so much for tuning in. And I hope you enjoyed this video. If you like what you saw, make sure you like, share and subscribe and follow me on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. I've been Titch and I'll see you guys in the next one. Take care. Revenge to sniff.